All right. Uh, we are uh, Charlie and Jason. You're here for the Andrew Project Workshop. The Andrew Project Workshop main purpose is to confirm, but continue to develop, continue to f uh, fan those flames of dependency on the Lord. I think one um, you'll hear Jason say something about if it if it starts with a abide or it doesn't start at all. So that's one of the purposes we want. I continue to. They hit another one would be to confirm and continue to develop a burden for the lost. We want to continue to confirm and develop a skill to both and live and speak the good news of the Holy Spirit's leading. And so those are the basically things we're going to hit real quickly. So basically that last one is going to be pretty the bulk of the Andrew project. So let's talk a little bit about this. Most of you have been in Japan long enough to find out there there is some barriers in sharing the gospel in Japan. And so let's write a few of these barriers down on the board real quick. So what are some spiritual or cultural barriers you have found in sharing the gospel in Japan? Language. Language, okay, yeah, that's definitely a tough one. Not just learning it, but just all the, the sayings and what to say. Sometimes we say something and they don't register uh, quite the way we're, we're looking at for it. Well, what else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do you catch an ear? Japanese tend to be really busy. It's almost you have to um, rope them down and tie them down for a little bit. They just seem to be busy all the time. So. Some more. How about uh, just the spiritual hardness? Um, we hear that um, through this couple of programs we've done that people have given this to spiritual hardness. Um, is it real fast? Things moving fast here in Japan? Has that been your um, experience? Uh, not, not normally. Usually it's very slow. But how about the um, politeness and top in mind where mm. they'll, they'll say yes, 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 but no, not inside. Nothing That's right. So just they tend to seem to agree. You think there's an openness there, but the more you kind of share, it kind of drifts away. Jason, anyone, one or two you want to mention there? Uh, in my uh, working and kind of sharing God's vision with people, I hear people say that won't work in Japan mm. a lot. That won't work here. It's different in Japan. Mm. Is this one okay to write with me? Yeah, sure. Of course, all of these are valid barriers, and we could probably go on and list very more, but in my own personal walk with the Lord, there's one in particular, as we kind of give a charge, as we kind of set um, an atmosphere of bringing our hearts to the Lord and asking him to do something in our lives as we look at this Andrew project, there's one that I really want to, for all of us, to look at, and that's the barrier of doubt in our own hearts. And so if you'll turn with me to Matthew 17 real quick, Matthew 17, verse 14, Matthew 17, Verse 14, I'm going to go ahead and read since our time is kind of short, so you catch up. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, I have, have mercy on my son. He said, he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus answers, he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive this demon out? And he replied, Because you have little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here and there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This has baffled me for a long time. What is going on? Why would Jesus come and just be so use so harsh language with these disciples? In my mind, they were doing the right things. In fact, in, in Matthew 9, the end of 9 to 10, you see them going in the pockets of people. They're going and, and sharing the gospel, and people are being saved, and healing is happening. And all of a sudden, we come to this passage, and Jesus is like saying, not you, not at first, not little faith. He says, you are perverse. Where is that coming from? Some translations saying twisted 
stuff. So where, where is exactly was that coming from? So a good mentor of mine uh, a few years ago um, looked at this passage, and so I want to kind of unravel it for you if you haven't heard it. The idea here of perversion is something unnatural, right? So homosexuality is very perverse. It's unnatural. It doesn't happen. And so for Jesus to use this word, we got to look and say, so what's unnaturally happening here? Well, see, what happened was disciples had taken what they thought they had had experienced before and Im- implemented those same kinds of praying and kind of casting out demons, but it didn't happen. The, the boy didn't get healed. In fact, the father says, I, I took him to your disciples, and they couldn't do anything. And so, and so this is what crept in. The doubt crept in. They kept thinking, well, if I can't do it, then it's not going to happen. Not even God himself could do this. And so this is where we want to start at as we launch at this. These spiritual barriers are very <laughs> relative. They're, they're there, and many more than this. But if we ever creep to the side that we think that it can't happen here in Japan, then we start going down a very dangerous road here. And so we don't want that to happen. James goes on and says, but let him who asks, James 1.6 says, but let him who asks in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of sea that is driven and tossed about by the wind. Yes, we're all susceptible to this, but today we want to start and say, no, God, not today. Doubt be cast out. Let's remember who he is. That's where we're going to start at right now. I think that's where Jason is going to start, is reminding us who God is, what's his heart. So we're going to cast that out. Pray with me as I read a prayer inspired by the, our Puritan, Puritan brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Thy bounteous goodness has helped me believe, but my faith is weak and wavering. Its light dim, its steps tottering, its increase slow, its backside sliding very frequent. It should scale the heavens, but it lies groveled in the dust. Lord, fan this divine spark into glowing flame. Lord, awake a faith to put forth its strength until all heaven fills our soul and all doubt is cast out. Amen. Okay. I know Charlie just led us, but I want to pray again right now. Let's just go to the Lord again together in prayer. Father in heaven, You are awesome and wonderful in all of your ways. We praise you, Lord, because we cannot help but praise you. You are altogether praiseworthy. And you are worthy of our love and worthy of our uh, loyalty, worthy of our service, worthy of our obedience, worthy are you of our very lives. And Lord, that's the least we could do. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity today to meet with brothers and sisters. You are so good to us, Lord. You have given us your spirit by which we cry out, Father, but you've also given us Christian family and fellowship. And what a blessing that is. Lord, we're here today because we want to be encouraged by you. We want to hear from you. And it would just be a waste of these people's time if all they hear is me today. Um, So I pray that would not be the case. Though I be unworthy, I pray that you would speak to your children through me today. And for all of us that are here, our heart's declaration is is that whatever you say, Lord, we want to do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I say evangelism, if I say that word, who do you think of? Lee Graham. Lee Graham. Anybody? Who do you think of? Okay, Paul. That's me. First, very first person I think of is Paul. And I think for most of us, the first are going to be Paul or Peter. But that's a problem right there. Because how many people in your life have you ever met that's like Peter or Paul? Have you ever met a Paul? I haven't yet. 
I've served the Lord in, in several different countries, and I've had the privilege of meeting people in several different countries, and I have met some very committed Christians in my life, people that, are, that I would like to be like. But I've never met somebody like Paul. So as missionaries and pastors, teachers, leaders in the church, when we say to people, we should share the gospel, we must be committed to evangelism, many times what they're hearing us say is, you got to be like Paul. And they're thinking, I can't do that. I can't be like Paul. So it sets up a barrier to people. And so that's kind of where Andrew comes in. And uh, that's why this process, this discipleship process, is called the Andrew Project. So Andrew is uh, hes a little bit different. He was one of the 12. He was an apostle. But nowhere in Scripture do you see Andrew standing in front of the group preaching or teaching. In fact, if the only Gospels that you read are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you won't even see Andrew mentioned very much. He's hardly mentioned. Now, the Apostle John, he tells us a little bit more about Andrew than the others. Uh, John sort of took note of Andrew. And we're not going to read these passages today, but in John chapter 1, verse 40 through 42, you see that it was actually Andrew that brought Peter, his brother, to Jesus. Well, what about that? Maybe I'll never have the language to be Japan's Billy Graham. Maybe, maybe I'll never get there. But what if I could be like Andrew? Or what if someone I disciple could be like Andrew and they found Japan's Peter or Japan's Paul and brought that person to Christ? You see in John chapter 6, verse 8 through 9, that it was Andrew who brought the boy with the fish and the loaves to Jesus. Later on in John chapter 12, verse 22, you see that Andrew and Philip brought the Greeks to Jesus. So Andrew was the first one that brought the Gentiles to Jesus in the temple just before Jesus was crucified. So becoming like Andrew, which is still a very good thing, is a lot easier for people to see themselves doing. It's something that people feel like, yeah, I could do that. So that's what we seek to do with the Andrew Project. Now, a moment ago when we kind of gave our summary of what we were going to be talking about today, I already shared a little bit of sort of brief testimonies with you about what we've seen happen in people's lives through the Andrew Project. Uh, hopefully, uh, at least one other, we'll hear one other testimony uh, in depth later on toward the end of this time together. But I would just mention now that like one couple that we uh, work with now, close friends with our, our, of ours, Shigenori uh, Owada and Pui, his wife. Uh, she's from Thailand, he's local Japanese. And their lives have really been transformed, starting with the Andrew Project. And we've seen them be uh, bold in sharing the gospel with people. We've seen them opening up their home and having people come in for dinner, for tea, for the purpose of sharing the gospel. Now, I'm not saying the Andrew Project brought all of that about, because we've also spent a lot of extra time with them, but it started with the Andrew Project. And I would also, I mentioned Shigenori because at the time he started the Andrew Project, he had been a Christian for less than a year. So, like Charlie already said, we're not talking about rocket science in here. There's nothing in here that's going to be like hard for anybody to understand. It's all very simple, all very practical, and easily, easily applicable. So, let's talk about it. What is the Andrew Project? Well, it's discipleship training. It's going, to focus, and it's going to focus on character development. It's going to look at not just what the gospel is that we are to be proclaiming. It is going to talk about what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be like Christ. And uh, before I forget, I do want to say uh, Charlie would be able to, to make these materials available to you. It's available in English and Japanese. So if you are interested in in leading a group through the Andrew Project, please do see Charlie. And I, I think, I'm sorry, brother, what's your name? Will. Will. I think Will is, would be able to take your email address down so that uh, you could be, this stuff could be made available to you. Um, anyway, now back to what I was saying. Focuses on char character development. It fo we focus in the Andrew Project on intentionally doing acts of kindness or service for other people as a way to express the love of Jesus. So like doing something for a birthday doesn't count. It's just a, an act of kindness that somebody's not expecting that we do deliberately and intentionally to show the love of Christ toward that person. 
and it focuses on helping the people who participate in knowing God more fully and more accurately. Now, the Andrew Project, so is a discipleship process, but that's not all. It's also an evangelism ministry. And notice I did not say evangelism training. How many of you as leaders have done evangelism trainings? Raise your hand. I have two, and I love evangelism trainings. I think they're great. I still do evangelism training. And in fact, the Andrew Project, I'll share in a minute, showed me that I needed to do some evangelism training as I went through this process with people. But I've done a lot of evangelism trainings. I've done them in America, I've done them in China, I've done them here. And the thing about an evangelism training is, is you have this group of people that come together and we're intensely focused on evangelism. You give people a method or a process, whatever you want to call it, and they go and we all go do it. Because the leader is saying, go, 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 go share. You know, and so it happens. But most of the time with evangelism training, what happens if you go back two months later? three months later, and talk to the people. Are they still sharing the gospel usually? In my experience, many times they're not. They, so what happens if that is our only evangelism training, if that's our only approach to evangelism in the church, that cycle reinforces a faulty mindset. It teaches people, oh, evangelism is something we do like four weeks of the year. Yeah, we do evangelism. Every year we do an evangelism training. So it makes, it leads people to think that evangelism is just a program in the church, one program among many. So, but with the Andrew Project, and buckle up, because you probably weren't expecting, even unless you read the, the blurb, we spend nine months with people. It is a six to nine month process. If you do the whole process, it takes nine months. It can be shortened to six, but we spend nine months together intentionally loving and intentionally seeking to show the difference Christ has made in our lives to five non-Christian friends. And I'm gonna talk more about what all that means, the five non-Christian friends, what we are doing in this process, but that's just a synopsis of what we're doing together. And again, it's not a training per se, it's a ministry. We are coming together as a group. And like, for example, if we were doing the Andrew Project here as a group, what we, we would be saying together is we're committing together to share the gospel with people and to love people so that they, through us they can experience the love of Jesus. And like, it's not like we meet and then everybody goes off and you're just on your own. We're working together. We're encouraging teamwork. We're encouraging, if you're afraid, take a friend. Take two friends and go work together. So it's a, it's a ministry that we're going to do together. Um, at the end of nine months, we're going to encourage each person to share the gospel with their five people outside the church building. We encourage them to take them to dinner, excuse me, or have them over to their home take them out for coffee, but it's an intentional meeting. They're meeting that person. I'm going to share the gospel with them today. If even after nine months, people still feel intimidated, we encourage them to do it in pairs or even small groups. Have a little party, a small party somewhere. Now, some other ideas that work with the Andrew Project. What we did is actually our whole group had a big party at the end. There's pluses and minuses to that, but at that we had a Christmas party, we had a meal, played a lot of games, but at the end had a local brother shared the gospel with the whole group. And um, we even, like for us, we even did a, par a party halfway through, sort of a warm-up party. We always like to have parties. So anyway, <laughs> um, as Charlie said, the purpose of the Andrew Project and this is the real, the, the important part, is to develop a burden for the lost among all believers. Now there's other things. It goes on to say, develop a dependence upon and a closer walk with the Lord and develop a skill to both live and speak the good news at the Holy Spirit's leading. But the most important part of that whole purpose is develop a burden for the lost among all believers. 
And so, you know, I don't care how good a training is. I don't care what you do with a group of people. Like if we, if we, uh, if we're doing the Andrew project here, usually what's going to happen is about 20% of you are really going to be changed by what we do together and really take it and be obedient with the training. That's kind of what Jesus experienced in the Gospels. I think many times when we read the Gospels, we forget that Jesus was preaching to multitudes of people. But out of the multitudes, there was a handful that were hearing the Word and obedient and faithful. So we should not expect to be any more successful than Jesus. He's the, he's the standard. He's as good as it gets, right? So, so that's what's going to happen. In this room, if we are doing the Andrew Project, most of you will come and listen and, oh yeah, that sounds good, and you might dabble with it a little bit, you might experiment with it a little bit, but it's not going to produce a change for most of you. But for about 20% of the people, it's going to produce a great <coughs> change. And that's what we experienced. Last year in 2017, we did the Andrew Project in Yokohama, and out of that group of about, by the end, we had about 16 people, and out of that group, about four were really transformed by this process. And those four are still faithfully sharing the gospel. They're still living with intentionality, still opening up their homes and pursuing the lost. And so we praise the Lord for that. And, you know, it again, there were many other things that were going on in the lives of these people besides just the Andrew Project, but it started with the Andrew Project. And we are still seeing people get saved because of what started with the Andrew Project. And more importantly, in some ways, we're still seeing Christians grow in Christ because of the way they, they, were, they really got to know the Lord through this process. Now, let's talk about the process. And I would, you know, because of time, we can't do a true thorough training on the Andrew Project. Like whenever I do this training for other IMB missionaries, it's like a seven hour training that we do. And then we actually go through lessons and different exercises. So this is more like an introduction to what it is. But um, let's talk about what we do. <clears throat> the first thing in the Andrew Project is every Christian in the room, every participant is going to choose five lost people that they can have a consistent personal interaction with over the next six to nine months. So Facebook friends, if that's all, if it's only Facebook or if it's video calling to America, that's good. We don't negate that kind of outreach, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that they can interact with personally. So they choose five. <clears throat> now, we had, we had some people in our group that had been in the church for a long time and they said, well, Pastor Jason, I've been a Christian for 25, 30 years and I don't really know any non-Christians anymore. All my friends are Christians and I spend all my free time in the church. And what I, you know, I wanted to say is, you know, are you kidding me? <laughs> We're in Japan. It's like 99.9% .9 lost and you don't know anybody. But, you know, that's not going to help. So if I do that... Actually, what I did was take the whole group through the circles of relationships. And I just had them list everybody they know. I said, I want you to write down the name of every person you know. And I said, first, I want you to write down your family members, your, your children, your husband, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your nieces and nephews. The next thing I want you to do is make a list. So that's like the center circle. And uh, well, like I draw it on the whiteboard. It's like, it looks like a bullseye. Concentric circles as we move out through our circles of relationships. So the next thing I want you to do is write down your coworkers. Every coworker you know that you talk to a lot every day at work. I want you to write down your classmates, people you graduated with. I want you to write down the people in your club, the people you play sports with. Now I want you to write down everybody you know that you don't really know them that well, but you're acquainted with them. And then I want you to write down people that you just see on a regular basis. The guy that cuts your hair or the lady that checks you out at Aon. I want you to write down people that you see on a regular basis. We take them through this. And I said, are any of them non-Christians? 
Well, yeah, there's a lot of non-Christians on the list. I say, I want you to prayerfully choose five of them that you're going to be committed to for the next nine months. So, you know, you don't assume anything. There's always somebody that's going to say something. And so you got to be ready to help them. It's not that they don't know any non-Christians, but they haven't been looking at people with spiritual eyes. They haven't been looking at people with the eyes of the Lord, and they don't see them as lost people. Now, throughout the Andrew Project, and this is probably the single most important piece of it, is every person that participates is going to commit to praying every day for those five people by name. And it's a very simple prayer. We're going to pray three things for them every day. We're going to pray that God would open a door for the gospel with each person by name. Second thing we're going to pray is that God would open the hearts. Excuse me. I got it, got it out of order here. I'm trying to, I don't know if I made a typo or not. I know what the three are, I'm not sure, but the order is probably not all that important. We're going to pray for God to open the hearts of the people we're praying for, that they could understand and believe the gospel. And the third thing we're going to pray is that God would open our mouths to speak with boldness and confidence the gospel to these people as he opens the door. Now, we're committing to doing this every day. Does anybody see a potential problem here? Somebody, uh, some of you are smiling. Don't. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna gonna speak. I just speak because I got like a lot to cover, and I got 45 more minutes. But if you got a question or something, just interrupt me or raise your hand. I don't care. It's no problem whatsoever. Anybody? What's what's the problem with praying every day for people like this? I think the, that would be part of it. But the first thing is remembering to do it. If it's not something you've been doing, if it's not been a part of your pattern, if it's not been part of your Christian discipline, I had to send an email to them every day for nine months to remind them. Now, that sounds cumbersome, but it's not because I sent the same email every day. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure by three months in, they're no longer reading it. But as long as they see the subject line... Pray for your five today, you know, and uh, that's okay. As long as they're reminded to pray, that's all right. So, um, yeah, we have to help them remember. And um, I just want to pause on that. One thing that's different from about the Andrew Project is that as a leader, unlike a lot of evangelism trainings I've done, I wasn't standing in front of the group saying, go share the gospel every time. Because a lot, of, uh, a lot of times evangelism trainings are sort of like that kind of motivation where you know that the t leader's going to ask you about it. And if you haven't done it, it's kind of, you feel embarrassed about it and everything. But I'm not doing that. I, w I do hold people accountable, and I will tell you what I hold them accountable to in a minute. But this is the cool thing about the Andrew Project. If we can lead our people to begin to pray for five non-Christians every day to pray this way, I didn't have one person out of the 20 that began who waited nine months to share the gospel. Everybody shared like three months in at the latest they were sharing because they've been praying and asking every day for an open door. And you think God's not going to answer that kind of prayer? And he did. And they saw the open door. At first, they didn't see it. They didn't even see the open door. But then they began to recognize the door. That, hey, the door's open. Am I going to share? And then they did share. And so everybody was sharing long before the nine months was up. And, um, so, and so what's cool about the Andrew Project is rather than me putting the burden on, on people, the Holy Spirit is putting the burden on people as they pray, all I'm doing is holding them accountable to prayer. That's one thing I'm holding people accountable to. Holding people to, accountable to prayer. And as they do pray, this, God changes their hearts. Now, do at least one practical thing. This is the uh, second part of the process. Starting at the very beginning, in the first month, we're going to start doing one practical thing for each person 
on our list of five. Just something to show love to them. Something to show that we care. Um, you might invite your friend to dinner. You might help your parent out with something around the house. You might help that elderly neighbor who has a hard time getting up and down the steps with the garbage. You might offer to carry the garbage out for that person. But we're going to do something, some act of kindness for each one. And I'm going to hold people accountable to that. I'm going to ask them about it. How are you doing? You might, if you speak English, you might teach English for a limited time. Help somebody getting ready for an English exam. Something to show that person that you love them so that through you, through me, they can experience the love of Jesus. And then the last thing, no, no, excuse me, next to last thing for as far as the process goes is that every believer is to ask Jesus to make a difference or show what difference has already been made in their lives that others can notice and then commit to showing that to people each day with the power of the Holy Spirit. Some examples about that might be, you know, I'm going to stop complaining at work no matter what happens. I used to grumble a lot about the way the boss treated us. I'm just going to stop doing that. People might commit to uh, only saying words to others that build, build them up. The brother that I mentioned a while ago, uh, Tatsuro, I actually have a, a video. He's going to share his own story here in just a minute. But um, he began to serve his family, especially his wife. And uh, she was a non-Christian, very anti-Christian very much against him being a Christian. And um, so but he began to go home and help around the house and do things to serve her, showing the character, showing, showing the difference that Jesus has made in his life. And then finally, the final thing is sort of like an evangelism training, is we're going to teach every believer how to share their personal testimony or their hope story and teach them how to share the gospel before December. <clears throat> Any questions up to this point? Okay. Like I said, <clears throat> the full Andrew project is it takes nine months. You can look at the lessons and kind of trim it some, trim it down to six months. There is an Andrew Project light that I'm not familiar with that was designed for university students. That means it's, you go through it in 16 weeks, basically the length of a semester. That's out there. Um, I've never used it. I'm sure it's, there's good, there's value in it. It's just that um, I just so happens I've never done that. Um, now, also a big part of the Andrew Project is vision casting because it's a nine-month process. And, you know, in nine months' time, it's really easy for people to really kind of lose focus on why we're getting together every Saturday, right? Why are we doing this again? So as the leader, it's up to us to keep uh, bringing that before them. The saying is true, vision leaks. So at least in nine months' time, if you're doing a nine-month process, you're going to at least need to share the vision about three more times during the course of the Andrew Project. Actually, I had to do it a lot more than that. I had to keep reminding people about who God is and what God's passionate about and as disciples, what our life's purpose is, these kind of things. Sometimes, so what, I, what I'm talking about right now, at least three times during the process, you're going to need to spend the whole time doing that. But then what I found was is even little bits here and there. Even as we were doing the training, I had to keep sowing that vision, holding up God's heart before the people, letting them see what the Lord's passionate about and reminding them why we're together. Um, so, um, you know, and I would encourage you, every group's going to be a little different, but be sensitive to the needs of your group. So I had been with my group in Yokohama for several weeks, and I really began to discern... Uh, that they were afraid. 
That was the bottom line. They really were afraid to share. And um, they were afraid to even sometimes try to talk to one of their five. And um, as I began to discern that, you know, I would just, um, I shared, I talked about God with them. And, um, you know, one example would be, you know, we talk about all these barriers. And I, and I did something like that. I gave everybody a slip of paper and um, a little square of paper and set them in the middle of the table. They were set, the tables were set up a lot like this. And at the beginning, I just told people, I want you to write down why it won't work. Write down why what we're doing will fail. Write down the barriers, the fears that you have. Just write them down. And I had a table set up in the middle of the room, and I said, I want you to just go put your, put your, fold, your piece of paper, fold it, and put it on that table. And they all did. I said, now, let's talk about the Lord together. I said, I want to remind you of the time in Exodus when Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt. And they came out of Egypt with a lot of rejoicing. They came out having plundered the people of Egypt. They had seen everything that God did in their midst, the many miracles, the many signs, how he struck the Egyptians. And in the end, he led them forth. And so Moses led them into the wilderness, and the first thing they do was camp by the Red Sea. And there they're camped. And in the meantime, as they have been traveling to this campsite, Pharaoh has a change of heart, and he says, what have I done? I have let Moses take away all the free labor. And so he got his chariots, and he got his army, and they pursued the people of Israel. And so Israel is camped by the sea, and the sea is on one side, and the armies of Israel... Or, bear, or the armies of Egypt are bearing down behind. And what did the people say? What did the Israelites say? They said, we're going to die. What have you done to us, Moses? What has God done to us? I mean, they were saying awful things about God. Was there not enough graves in Egypt that he brought us out here for us to die in the wilderness? We are going to die. And that's what everybody said except for one person. Who? Who spoke differently? Okay, I'll give a hint. Who was the leader? <laughs> <laughs> Moses. Moses was the one man in Israel. We don't even hear Joshua or Caleb mentioned in this story. Moses was the one man in Israel, and he said, you don't have to be afraid today. You be still and you watch that God will fight for you today and you see what he will do today. Did the people of Israel face barriers as they were pursuing their mission to go into the promised land? You better believe they had barriers. In this story, they had the Red Sea on one side, they had the armies of Egypt on the other, and they were caught in the middle. But Moses out of all the people in Israel, kept his focus on God Almighty, and they experienced God's deliverance. They experienced God overcoming the barriers. And what I want to tell you guys is, is you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the know-how. You don't have to be a skilled evangelist. All you have to do is keep your focus on the Lord, and He can overcome all this. He really can. And I had, you know, just repeatedly have to encourage like that. And, and fortunately, <laughs> I guess because God knows who we are as people, there's tons of stories like that in the Bible that encourage us that all we have to do is be faithful, keep our focus on the Lord, and He will overcome. And so that's an example of vision casting. That's one kind. Now, your group may need something a little bit different. Their, their hang up may be that I don't know enough. What are you going to say to someone who doesn't know enough? Okay, God knows it all. And that's a true statement. Amen. But how's that help me? Because I'm, I'm the one talking right now. <laughs> so, sharing what you know. Yeah, they were untrained. That's right. Well, I like all you guys have given good answers. And, and every answer that's been given is good. 
and it's something to build on and explain to people because God does have all the answers. And guess what? The Holy Spirit lives in us and He can help us have the answers. The disciples were untrained. So it's okay that you're untrained. Just be obedient and He will help you. But I always like to go to the story about the man named the, the man born blind. And uh, so you know the man is born blind. And uh, the disciples, there, Jesus is walking with the disciples and the disciples say, Lord, who was it that sinned? This man or his parents that he should be born blind? And Jesus said, it's neither one. It's so that the glory of God can be demonstrated today. And he healed the man. And so, of course, um, the man wound up, you know, without going into all the details, the man wound up in front of the Sanhedrin being questioned because of this miracle that took place. And um, this is where it comes. I think this is so funny. The Sanhedrin says, he's a sinner, isn't he? Jesus, this man who heals you, confess it. He's a sinner. And the guy says, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. That's the worst testimony in the history of testimonies, okay? <laughs> That's like heresy, you know? I mean, this guy says, I don't know if Jesus is a sinner or not. All I know is I was blind and now I see. But you know what? His testimony was counted worthy by God to be written down for your encouragement and mine. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to. I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but I know he's changed my life. If they ask something you don't know, say you don't know. And I tell people, I, I said this over and over, you're not going to make your friends more lost than they already are. <laughs> The situation is already hopeless. They're on the way to hell. That's as bad as it gets, okay? You cannot get them any worse than what they are right now. Any, nothing you say is going to make it worse. But you know, that sounds funny to us, but it's not to people that I was leading. Now, they were genu genuinely relieved to hear those kinds of things. I don't have to have all the answers to be pleasing to God. And it is true. They're already separated from God. And anything that I share is going to be more than they know today. So we just have to keep people focused on the right thing. First of all, focused on the power of God, that He is able to work through us. He's able to overcome barriers. We also have to keep people focused on God values obedience and brings fruitfulness. Sometimes we're not careful we teach that God values fruitfulness, which is something beyond my ability to do and beyond your ability to do. God values faith and obedience. And if we do those things, He's pleased. No matter what fruit comes from it. Now, well, I also encourage people that if we are obedient and we continue having trust in God and being obedient, we're also going to bear fruit. Because that's also promised in Scripture. But we also have to work with the understanding. That's not our, that's not within our power to produce. So, Many times, a lot of what I shared just now, like the thing about Pharaoh, the, the thing about the man born blind, that's not necessarily in the Andrew Project. So you've got to be ready to bring your own things to the table to help people be encouraged and challenged in a healthy way to press on. Now, any uh, questions or comments? I know what happens. So you get this 2.30 time slot. It's about the time everybody's getting drowsy at a time at, a, at one of these meetings. So that's okay. I understand. I was sitting out there just a few minutes ago. Um, yes. So um, people that are on the Andrew Project, mm -hmm. I mean, in the when they start to hang out with their five friends in this intentional way, do they often tell them? Not right away, because usually it's someone they already have a relationship with. And um, it's not so much about a new relationship as it's a new way of seeing that relationship, a new way of approaching that relationship. So they've already been hanging out with them. Now, if anybody notices any difference, it's going to be that this, hopefully this person's talking about Jesus more. And um, 
Um, so that would be the difference. It, the hanging out certainly is something that's not new, but it is the, the, the nature of the conversation. Anyone else? Yes? What happens at the end of the six to nine months? Mm -hmm. What happens to maybe the go getters who share with their five people really early? Like, do you still, like, is there a follow up? Is there any so that's going to be up to uh, every church to develop that process. Um, we recently, this year, planted a church and, and um, started a church um, in this past April. This is not the group that I did the Andrew Project with. I, I was invited by a pastor at an international Baptist church in Yokohama to do um, the Andrew Project in 2017. Um, so that part of it in 2017 was kind of up to the church to follow up with that. I mean, they had a process for, you know, but obviously the goal is to get them to invite them to church and bring them to help them become part of the body. And also as to, and this is what's cool, I mean, of course, once one of your five gets saved, you go back to that bigger list that we made at the beginning, prayerfully choose one other non-believer to put back on the list to keep it at five. So you want to keep, and what we, um, what we really want to do is, is help people make this kind of praying, praying for the lost, as part of their way of life. It's not something we're just doing right now, it's something we're going to continue. And so people we disciple... We, we do this with almost everything we do. And we are praying for every person in our church has, we have three, uh, three non-Christians that they're praying for all the time, praying for their non-Christian friends. And I'm still sending out a, a reminder, email reminder, even to the people in our church. I don't do it every day. Maybe every couple of days I'll send out a reminder to be praying. But um, so thank you. Any other questions? Okay, all right. Um, some Andrew Project essentials. <clears throat> and I've already mentioned these, but I just wanna, I wanna re-mention them now just to emphasize how important. The three pillars of the Andrew Project is the praying every day, because that really puts, the, the Holy Spirit is gonna be the one that puts the burden on their heart. You don't have to be the bad guy. And actually, they don't even see it as a bad thing. If the Holy Spirit gives the burden, it's a joyful burden. They want it. Two, um, intentionally doing at least one practical thing each month to show the love of Jesus. This is of paramount importance. And I just want to share with you, if I could transparently let you benefit from my ignorance. Last year was the first time I did this. And if I did one thing wrong, I wish I could go back and do it over, was to hold people more accountable to this. And I'm going to talk about accountability in a minute and how we did that, but, but um, to really keep encouraging them, because this is the kind of thing that gets pushed aside the most, because it's, it's a time commitment, you know, and there's schedule conflicts, and sometimes it doesn't work out, and when it doesn't work out the first time you try, you might not do it at all that month. And so I really believe if... If I had encouraged people to um, be more diligent in this second thing, showing acts of kindness, I believe we would have seen more people saved. We already we saw several saved throughout the course of the year, and in fact, we're still seeing people get saved through some of the, the discipline that was learned through this project. Um, so... I think this is really important. And then finally, intentionally showing the difference that Jesus has made in your lives. That, that's more like the inner fruit, but, but the character of Christ, not grumbling, not criticizing, building people up with your words. So we want to, those are the three pillars of the Andrew Project. And I already mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. If they pray the three opens every day, they're going to begin to share the gospel with their five people long before Christmas ever comes around. Now, but the reason I mention it again now, I do want to say some things about that. When, they, when your people, if you choose to do this, when your people begin to share the gospel, pay attention to what you're hearing because what I began to hear was, like I say, maybe four weeks, six weeks, two months into this process, people, all I'm asking is 
tell me how God's been answering your prayer. Well, one day, somebody came in and said, well, God opened a door to share, and I shared. But they didn't want to believe. And they were despondent. And I just encouraged, it's okay. God loves your obedience. God is very pleased with what you did. And, um, <clears throat> but I kept, kept hearing that. <coughs> After several times of hearing people say that, just one day the Holy Spirit gave me wisdom to say, could you tell me a little bit about what you're sharing? And um, they said, yeah. Well, I told them I was a Christian and invited them to come to church with me last Sunday and they didn't want to come. And so then I realized this may not be a problem for your group, but for my group, the Holy Spirit was giving them a burden to share the gospel, but guess what? They had no idea how to do it. So what I did for people who were already getting that burden, who were wanting to share, I invited them aside to my home and began to model opening the home for them, hospitality. And that's another thing. I, this, is a, this wasn't on the board. This is a big barrier in Japan. Hospitality is a spiritual gift, and it's a commandment from the Lord. And um, a Christian home may be the only place of light in your city and in your neighborhood. It's the one place in Osaka or wherever you live that the presence of the enemy does not rule. So there is a reason that our Lord commands hospitality. It's not just a cultural thing. It's a kingdom thing. And so we uh, invite people in a lot, model hospitality for them, show them that, teach them why it's important, and they also begin to invite people into their homes once they know that it really is something that's important to Jesus and they see how to do it. So that's another thing. When you invite people in, keep it simple because you want it to be something people feel like, yeah, I can do this. You know, I, can, I can handle this. But anyway, so... I invited them in, began to teach them how to share the gospel, how to share their testimony, teach them what the gospel is. And um, so then the gospel really began to go out through some of these people who were getting trained. So when they start saying they're sharing, do pay attention to what they're sharing because it may point to some other needs that you are assuming they have, but they don't, the, the tools, but they don't have the tools. Um, now, You've heard me mention accountability several times. And so this is the other thing. I told Charlie, Charlie was asking what I was going to talk about today. And I said, if I talk about anything, I'm going to talk about one-third, one-third, one-third. Because this, if you don't do this, the Andrew Project is just going to become another Sunday school class or another Bible study, and not much is going to happen. So let's say, whatever amount of time you have that you have designated for the Andrew Project, and I would recommend, if you're working in one language, whether it be Japanese or English, that you would give it an hour and a half. 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. I was having to work through a translator, so I, I did like two hours and, and ran long sometimes. And, um, but anyway, you're gonna, whatever time you have designated, you're going to break it into threes. Three thirty, let's say it's an hour and a half, three minutes, three periods of 30 minutes. The first 30 minutes is accountability. And that's what really sets it apart. And actually, for us, for me and my wife and people on our team, we do everything we do with people. It's based on this one-third, one-third, one-third. Because, you know, if they're Christians and they're in a church, they probably have enough Bible studies. We need something different. We need equipping and accountability to go put the equipping in action, and that's where this comes in. So the first 30 minutes we get together, I open in prayer, and it's not threatening. In fact, I'm going to tell you at the front, the first third, the 30, first 30 minutes became everybody's favorite time of the night. And I, I, it, it started slow because the group was mostly Japanese and nobody wanted to share about what was happening. But it got to be the favorite part where that I had to like cut it short. Okay, we got to get to the lesson now. So we're going to transition. So what is this accountability? Well, it is, first thing I'd say, somebody share with me how God is answering your prayers. How have you seen God answer your prayers? And we heard great testimony. Now again, the first few weeks, it was very quiet. And then finally somebody shared 
and I was very affirming. And these are teachable times too. I don't care what anybody did. If anybody was obedient in some way, shape, form, or fashion, I said, there's a lot we can learn from brother so-and-so or sister, sister so-and-so. We can learn. And I didn't just say that. I went through what we can learn. And so actually when the first time or two when I did that and people realized I wasn't going to shame them, then everybody wanted to share after that. They began to share, you know. And um, so, um, and I wasn't being hypocritical. That we really can learn from one another. And if anybody makes an effort at being obedient, there is something we can learn from that. And so um, I would say, tell me how God's answering prayers. How's, how did you see him open a door for the gospel? How did, how did you see him open your mouth? How did you see him open that person's heart? And then, um, then I would say, tell me about how you're, and this is where I was weak. I already shared with you, but I did do it. Tell me about how it went when you showed love to your people this week. Show me how God worked through that. And, um, and then, of course, tell me how you were able to demonstrate the character of Christ this week. We had some powerful testimony from some of the people as they began to, to really show love and to show a servant heart toward people. Um, and then uh, we, uh, I would say, if you did have a conversation with somebody, would you mind sharing about that? People would share. And um, when somebody got saved, the first time it happened, I, I said, you know, it's kind of corny, but this is what I did, and it became something everybody loved. But I said, you know, the angels in heaven are rejoicing over this new sister in Christ, and we're not going to sin by not rejoicing. And I counted three, and we all shouted hallelujah. This became a tradition that stuck throughout the time, and I found out later my brother, Shiganori, he's saying, yeah, I used to come every week hoping to hear hallelujah tonight. And, you know, I didn't know. To me, it was something kind of silly, you know, but it was important to the group. And, um, but anyway, so that's the first third, that accountability. And so what I would do, I'll give you an example. Shiganori, during the first 30 minutes, shared that he invited his friend and family and that family over to his house for dinner. And he intentionally shared his testimony. We teach everyone to share their testimony in three minutes. He shared his testimony with his non-Christian friend, used to be a co-worker, and he gave them a track and asked them to read that track and said, the next time we get together, I want to talk with you about this track. Well, man, there was a lot in that to share with the group. I mean, first of all, there was intentionality. She can only didn't just wait until that person brought up Jesus. He invited the person to his home. And also, that's something worthy of imitating. He showed hospitality. And then he, uh, he uh, did not wait for the person to ask about Christ. He just shared his testimony about how Jesus had changed his life. He gave a tract. And he made an appointment to follow up about it. So there's a lot of good things there that we can all learn. So I, I kind of unpacked that for everybody. Had another brother. I don't know if it was the same night or not. And um, he talked about how, yeah, you know, one of his five he'd been praying for every day. He said, I invited him over to my home. And, and um, so he said, I remember what Esther, Esther's my wife's name. He said, I remember what Esther said about how if you're afraid to share the gospel, you can get your tract out and ask your Japanese friend to help you practice your Japanese. <laughs> so Joseph is not Japanese, obviously, but he's, he said, so, so that's what I did. And this man read through the whole tract, and he said, I could tell at first he was helping me with Japanese, but then he got interested and was really reading it. And he said, so, um, so I, he... Uh, he uh, read it, and, and it was a good time, and I was, I was so thankful for it. And I, I didn't really ask him if he wanted to be a Christian or not. So when it was time to kind of unpack that, I said, I, I affirmed everything good. You know, Joseph, you were also very intentional. You invited this person over, and you knew you were afraid, but you found a way around your fear, and you, you opened the door for the gospel by asking him to read this tract. And he read it, and I said, but you know, in Joseph's case, if there was anything he could have done better... Um, it would have been to ask the person, would you like to believe? Would you like to be a Christian? And so uh, if I were to do that again, I might do that. And so everybody, Joseph was very encouraged, and he also said, yeah, that's right, and the group was encouraged. But using these testimonies is teachable time. I mean, establishing, first of all, making it a safe place for people to share, 
And then using that time to learn from one another was really, really important in our time together. And then the middle third, I won't say as much about it, is the time for teaching new material. That's kind of self-explanatory. There's a lesson for each night, and uh, you just cover that material. And uh, there's different, it's very flexible. You can do small group exercises or just teach it to the group, however you want to do, but you're gonna teach your lesson that night. And the final 30 minutes is also very important, and that is, it depends on what we covered that night, but for example, if we talked about sharing our testimony with others, we're going to spend time practicing sharing our testimony in the last 30 minutes. We're gonna practice that new skill. Maybe we talked about showing the love of Jesus to our non-Christian friends. Well, you can't really practice that in the room because there's no non-Christians in there, but we be, I would give them 30 minutes to make goals, specific measurable goals about what they were gonna do in the next three weeks to put this into practice. And so that's the final third. So the final third, the 30 minutes where they make goals, where you give assignments, that's gonna be the basis for your accountability the following week. You're gonna to want to be sure that the following week you begin to hold them accountable for that. Any questions or comments? I wish y'all would ask more questions. I'm getting so hoarse up here. <laughs> yes. The Andrew Project? Charlie, has, he has it to make available. If you will give his, your email address or contact information, to, to, he, they will get that for you. And again, it's available in English and Japanese. So it's actually available in Chinese too, but anyway. So I don't <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah, that's, that's right. It is like my group started out at around 20. I really expected it to shrink, but it didn't shrink much. By the end, we, only, we had about 16, and that was because several people moved away, not because they dropped out. So um, that group was almost too big at, at 18 people. It's just to say 18. That was almost too big because what you want... Especially like, you take this group. If we're doing the Andrew Project, and I open up 30, you know, I have the first 30 minutes for accountability, it's real easy for you back row people to be anonymous. You're not really gonna be held accountable, right? Because it's easy to come into a room with people, this many people in it, and I ask, share testimony about how you've been obedient. And you can sit there and look obedient and never be held accountable with, about whether you were obedient or not. So, I would say 10 to 12 would be ideal. If I had more people that wanted to do it, knowing what I know now, like that group, I would have uh, divided and had like cohort leaders in the room that I spent extra time with training for the accountability. But you wanna be sure that the accountability happens in a small enough setting that people are actually held accountable. So that's the driving force to group size. Yes. Uh, Video. It was surprising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in what ways are you seeing it kind of go to the second generation? Are you guys providing training for the people we're training to then lead their own and private groups, or what does that look like? Thank you. Again, now that goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. In any group, about 20% of the people are the ones that are going to kind of be transformed by that. But yes, our core group, that core group that really took this and went all in with it. They've become our core partners. They've become like team members for our mission team. And um, so we've trained them on, um, for example, we have what's called the Story of Redemption Bible Study, which is an eight lesson Bible study. It's mainly for non-Christians. It's about what it is to be a Christian, but it's also good for basic discipleship too, but we've trained people on how to do that. I've had several men go and begin to talk to their coworkers at work, Japanese salary men, they go talk to their coworkers at work about Jesus a little bit and, uh, and then invite them, would you like to study the Bible during lunch? And they've had good response with it, people studying at lunch. I think we don't really appreciate what a barrier it is for Japanese people to come to church. 
And so I'm not against inviting people to church, and I don't tell people not to, but if that's the only tool in your tool bag, you're not going to see much growth. Because for a lot of times for Japanese people, religion's very much a location thing. So we need to do better at getting people tools to take the word and the gospel out to where people are comfortable hearing about it and thinking about it. So, and we've trained them to do that. We have a new life Bible study thing that's for new believers to train new believers. So we've had success. I mean, we've had uh, several of our people have been real faithful in doing some of these other things with other Christians and with non-Christians. But it kind of all started with the relationship that was built here at the Andrew Project and the trust and the intentionality. Okay, what I want to do right now, I've got a eight minute video that's a testimony by one of the brothers that participated in the Andrew Project. He's Japanese, uh, but there's English subtitles, and I think you'll be able to see them. We're out of time for now, and I just would give an update. Since the making of this video last March, he's led another person to Christ since that time. He continues to grow in his faith. He continues to be bold in sharing the gospel. His wife, who was very much against Christianity, and um, they had a, a really toxic marriage at that time. You know, at that time, we've seen their marriage continue to grow healthier, and uh, it's even better now than what it was. He shared at the end of this video, and uh, she's actually coming to church every Sunday now. She's not a Christian yet, but she's coming to church, and uh, she actually sat down for Bible study with Tatsudo Shigenori and Pui, and went through those eight lessons. So definitely, we see the Lord working. You know, opening her heart to the gospel, and uh, um. He's been a faithful worker for the Lord, and, we're, and uh, uh, he was kind of nervous. But this is his. I mean, he knew he was being filmed, and other people were going to see it, so he was rather nervous about it. But we didn't coach him on any of this. We asked him to share a testimony about how the Andrew Project had helped him, and this is what he came back with. So let me close this in prayer, and then I'll turn it over to you, Matt. Father, we thank you for this time together as brothers and sisters. We praise you for your faithfulness. We ask that you help us to be faithful too. Lord, I do pray for each one of us in this room that we would just be so, have our hearts and our minds and our eyes so completely focused on you that, that nothing could make us afraid. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, um, to love one another, to hold one another accountable, and that we would dare to attempt great things for your name's sake in this city. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, join me in thanking Jason. Jason, thank you for coming all the way from Yokohama to share with us. And uh, we appreciate Charlie and Jason, all that you guys are doing. Um, and, you know, this is an amazing practical way, an actual practical way to empower and equip people. Um, so if you want more information on that, you can speak with Will and Elizabeth. Um, they're going to get your information and they'll send you more, uh, more information on how you can get involved and get some more materials for that.